<laughs> okay. So yes, the main question we'll be we'll be talking about is whether enlightenment is possible or not. But before we um, before we get into that, mm -hmm. I thought maybe we could just take a step back. Um, and yesterday you were um, you were talking about suffering, uh, and you were talking about you were talking about three different types of suffering we mm -hmm. encounter: the suffering of um, just ordinary pain, mm -hmm. the suffering of uh, the sort of insecurity of change, mm -hmm. and the suffering of what you talked about as an, a sort of existential um, unfulfillment, mm -hmm. this sense that there, mm -hmm. there has to be more. Mm -hmm. And you were encouraging uh, us to really look at uh, those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and what you were saying would happen if we did, or could happen mm -hmm. if one did, is that uh, a vast space might open up. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if we could uh, move into that vast space today, if we could... Uh, <laughs> By all means, let's go. <laughs> so is that, is, that what, is that enlightenment? Or um, what, do we, what do we mean when we talk about enlightenment? And how is that related to this problem of, of suffering? Mm. <coughs> uh, what do you mean by enlightenment? Yeah. My goodness. I thought you were going to give me easy questions. Um, what do we mean by enlightenment? Well, of course, we mean, first of all, just the, the relief from all uh, suffering. That's straightforwardly what it means, is that you no longer suffer in the, the deepest sense of all. You feel completely fulfilled. Of course, while you have a body, uh, you're still subject to pain in the, in the, in the immediate sense. And the Buddha is shown in the scriptures to have suffered pain in that sort of way. You are still subject to change, but change doesn't bother you. You're, you're, you're not invested in conditioned things, so the, the change that comes with uh, the movement of conditioned things doesn't, doesn't trouble you at all. You've got no, no stake in the game, so it changes. But at the deepest level, you feel completely at peace, completely at ease, no sense that there's more to be done. In fact, the Buddha says that, doesn't he, again? Done is what had to be done. So the, uh, the, this unfulfillment is, uh, is completed, is fulfilled. So that, that's, that's the basis of it, isn't it? That the experience of, uh, of enlightenment is one of complete <coughs> uh, detachment from all conditioned things. Detachment in the sense that you do not any longer identify yourself with anything conditioned, which we do all the time. We identify ourselves with the body, we identify ourselves with our, with our identity, uh, with being this, being that, being white, Englishman, and so forth. But you, you just stopped all that. Uh, you, your, your, your awareness, your consciousness is not bound up with conditioned things. The Buddha talks of unbinding the conscious, uh, unbinding vijnana, consciousness, from the other datus, that is from earth, water, fire, air, and space. So they're there, they're taking place, but you don't think, that's me. And uh, therefore, you're not going to be affected by the, the changes that take place. That'll do for a start, won't it? <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's highly desirable, I think, hope you've also seen. It's uh, a state, therefore, because you are free from... Uh, suffering and because you feel a deep sense of satisfaction, it's a state of the, the, the highest possible enjoyment, bliss, fulfillment. Uh, nibbana paramang sukkang, the Buddha says in the, in the Dhammapada, the, the, the Nibbana, Nirvana, uh, that is the unbinding, the release, is uh, the, the highest happiness, the highest bliss. Mm -hmm. So. If you uh, you talk about sort of unbinding consci consciousness, mm. being sort of unbound from mm. yeah. the other the other elements, yeah. so it's hard to sort of it can be hard to imagine what one would be sort of left with in that in that sense. You talk about you talk about bliss, but yeah. without any yeah. of the common framework, how mm. might we sort of how might we connect with? Um, well, we can't. <laughs> because, because for us, the, 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 the sources of, of uh, connection are completely different from, from what, uh, what enlightenment is. Do you see what I mean? So that we, we, 
if we're going to think about enlightenment from our uh, own point of view, we're going to be projecting onto, onto what transcends our own point of view, what stands within our point of view, if you see what I mean. So uh, we, 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 miss, we miss the point. So perhaps in a way, that's the first thing we need to realise, that we, we, we don't understand and we can't understand from the point of view of our ordinary conceptual consciousness. So I had a very strong experience at Bodhgaya a few years ago. Uh, I don't know whether anybody's been there, where the Buddha gained enlightenment. And uh, <coughs> the Bodhi tree is there, the tree which is the great grandchild of the tree that the Buddha sat under. And uh, it's fe fenced off. But I used to go and sit as close as I could to the Bodhi tree just behind the fence. And I could see through a tiny slit in the railing the, uh, the Vajrasana, the seat where the Buddha sat, or at least something that marks the seat where the Buddha sat. I remember sitting there one day and suddenly it really dawned on me that it did happen there. And at the same time, that I had absolutely no idea what it was that had happened. So both the, the, the historical um, certainty from my point of view at that time contrasted with my complete failure to grasp what it was. And it's odd that in that moment of, of failing to grasp what it was, I got a little taste, taste of it, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. So that it's when, when the ordinary mind that we use to think about these things is confounded that you actually get a little taste of what it is. Mm. Because it's sort of from, it can easily seem, can't it, like, um, like if we, if it, if it goes beyond all of our possible frameworks of right. understanding, yeah. then from where we are now, we can only take that on, take that um, on trust in a way, that that, that, that is a, uh, hmm. that that is possible yeah. in a way. I suppose yeah. you 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 talked about an experience that might point beyond that, right. but without without that, um, yeah. we sort of we can't know. So how could we, I guess, take steps towards right. that kind of experience? That yeah. Well, I suppose so far we've been talking mainly conceptually mm. because of the framework of your question, uh, but there are other ways of of uh, of being certain, if you like, um, which are much harder to to speak about, and you know we speak of those as faith. Uh, which <coughs> is a term in our own culture that has a rather specific meaning. In the Buddhist context, it means something rather, rather more than that. So it's a direct, intuitive uh, sense of, uh, of the Buddha and of his enlightenment, which may not be very conceptually uh, um, clear. You may not be able to quite say why, but I remember that very distinctly the, the first time I read about the Buddha. I was at, uh, at university and uh, one evening after imbibing certain substances I, um, I opened a book on mysticism and that suddenly made, dawned on me that there was another mode of consciousness. I studied philosophy but we never told us that there were other modes of, of understanding, other modes of, uh, of uh, experiencing, no, other modes of certainty. So uh, what I read just alerted me to the fact that all religion was not as I'd seen it. So I went off and bought all the scriptures of the various <coughs> religions. I bought the Tao Te Ching and the Upanishads and the Vedas and the Al Quran and, and so on. I bought the lot and one book of Buddhist scriptures. And I just dipped into them. And the only one that really I found appealing to me was the Buddhist scriptures. It's Edward Conzer's uh, collection, the Penguin Editions. It's a nice little collection. And as soon as I read that and read about the Buddha, because it has extracts from the Pali Canon, uh, I just felt completely sure that this was uh, uh, the man who embodied what I had been unknowingly looking for for so long. Uh, of course, I couldn't prove it to anybody, but I knew that this man was, uh, was, had gone as far as it was possible to go and that he had experienced and achieved what I wanted to achieve, what I wanted in my own life. So, uh, yes, uh, intellectually we can only go so far, and the intellect generally can only take us to the uh, the limits of the known by showing what we can't know. If you see what I mean, it can take us to the point at which we know we can't know more, 
which is a quite a big achievement, actually, if you can get to that point. But then it's imagination, if you like, and uh, uh, faith as, a, as a, a, a way of thinking about imagination that reaches what goes beyond intellectual understanding. And probably what has brought most people here in one way or another, an, an intuitive sense that is something more. So the, uh, <coughs> the, um, I can identify with that sense of there must be, there must be more. I'm there jolly must glad be to hear more. it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, um, I, I suppose what you're saying is a kind of, um, the Buddha then becomes uh, an embodiment of, of that. Uh, it becomes something more, more concrete to move, right. move towards. Yes. But um, so I can I can I can definitely resonate with that. I think it, it's more like enlightenment. Perhaps this is moving back into the conceptual realm. But enlightenment mm -hmm. can be uh, sort of talked out a lot about in lots of different uh, ways. Some mm -hmm. of them very very lofty. Mm -hmm. um, I mean the sort of uh, ideals of com sort of something completely limitless and these human qualities mm -hmm. taken to uh, human qualities that we might try and cultivate of mm -hmm. of love and. Uh, awareness of others mm. and so on and so forth, taken to uh, something far beyond what we can imagine. Right. Um, I guess. How can we know that there's a that it's that that the Buddha sort of completed something of that task? Like, is it possible? Like, is it possible that we could be moving towards something that is further on from us? But how oh. do we know that it's a uh, something that's talked about as sort of full and perfect and sort of completed mm. in a way. Mm. Is it completed? And, and if mm. so, sort of how can we, how mm. can we know that? Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I in a sense, we can't know. Well, I, I remember Sangharakshita once said that in, in enlightenment is the point on the horizon over which the Buddhas appear. Mm. Do you see what I mean? So that there's, a, there's, a, there's as far as we can imagine, far, far more than see, uh, which is, it's over that horizon that Buddhahood lies. But what precisely it is, we, we, we cannot say. But what we can say is that it's, uh, it's not a linear thing. So it's not a point on a, on a line, uh, because that implies what, being here and moving to there. So it's the point at which all that sort of conceptual construction just, just fades, just disappears. You can't, you can't grasp it. And so, is there sort of, I guess, is there sort of one enlightenment, or is there kind of, is it something more? Both. Mm. 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 Uh, uh, well, uh, 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 something I've been reflecting on recently, uh, 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 a poem, in a Buddhist poem, which says, uh, uh, of, of one and more, it's void. So, it, it because... Uh, one and more, one enlightenment and many enlightenments, belongs within the conceptual framework. It's only the, the conceptual mind that divides and, uh, and counts. Counting number belongs within the, 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 the field of conceptual understanding. Do you see what I mean? So that when you've transcended that conceptual understanding, to speak of one or many doesn't really make sense. So, so sometimes the Buddhist tradition says... Uh, that that uh, it's not two. <laughs> Implicitly saying it's not one either. <laughs> um, but you, because our, uh, our ability to, um, to count, if you like, is confounded. It's a, a dimension in which number does not operate. You can encounter this, uh, and some people here will have done the six element practice in which you look at... Um, at consciousness, and you look at the way in which your consciousness is not, does not contain I. If you look, if you examine the contents of consciousness, you cannot find a fixed, unchanging self. Um, and so some people then ask, well, um, is, is my consciousness different from his or her consciousness? But really the, the question begins to dissolve when you get to that level of understanding of consciousness. It, uh, it trans transcends the idea of one and many. Sorry to be so awkward, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you're asking me questions with elicit these particular answers. <laughs> it's all his fault. 
So I think I'm dissolving slightly, so I might change tact. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe that's sort of bringing it, uh, bringing it back to you. So, uh, <laughs> so you've been, you've been uh, ordained for 46 years yesterday. You've been practising yeah. uh, sort of very intensively in that time and well, before. Very nice of you to say <laughs> so. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you've just, and you've just come back from six months of which were just by yourself, meditating and, uh, and reflecting on the Dharma. There were a few sheep around. But <laughs> a few sheep around. And... Um, <laughs> did, did you get enlightened? <laughs> well, of course, it, it, it's uh, it's really rather indecent to ask. That, <laughs> um, uh, what what uh, Sangharakshita said when somebody asked him that was, well, if I said uh, I was, how would you know that I was speaking the truth? If you see what I mean. If I said I wasn't, what difference would it make? But I'm going to be more modest than that and say that uh, I, I don't consider that I've gained enlightenment. I, I, I've experienced something, and I certainly experienced a lot more of, uh, of uh, what is in the direction of enlightenment than I've ever done before, as one would hope one does, day by day. But uh, in, in that retreat, I, I did get to a deeper level of, of uh, understanding, where I was able to just stay completely free from the, that uh, dukkha, that urge to, to be, to create oneself, and was able to just stay in the open blue sky for whole many seconds at a time. <laughs> uh, no, a little bit longer than that, but uh, just able to stay in that. And, uh, you know, I've been confident for many years, through my own experience, that enlightenment is a reality. doesn't mean I'm claiming I've gained enlightenment, but... Uh, because of the, the, the small progress that I have made, I've got some uh, definite experience, which I cannot uh, sell to you, as it were. I've got some definite experience that enlightenment is a reality, that it's attainable. In some ways, it's not that hard. <laughs> I remember Bante saying that, uh, that if people put half the energy into enlightenment that they put into their sex lives, they would get there immediately. <laughs> that puts things in proportion, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yes, uh, uh, it, it, after 46 years, if I, if I said that I'm no nearer than I ever was, it would be a bit of a, bit of a shame, wouldn't it? Uh, but, yes, I definitely am quite a bit nearer and have a definite... The taste is in my mouth and not just the taste of a taste. I've tasted what it is, which is not something very exceptional. Um, in some ways, I think I tasted that many, many years ago, but I was able to sit more fully in it, if you see what I mean. I was able to remain in it more than I've ever done. Oddly, I think that my uh, grasp of enlightenment, since that's our topic, is no greater than it's ever been. As soon as I experienced... Uh, but as soon as I read that uh, selection of sutras, uh, and especially some other things I read that were in the same volume, the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, there's a short version of the Tibetan Book of the Dead then, there, I, I knew of my own experience that enlightenment was a reality, uh, that it was completely attainable, and that I had a taste of it. But what I've done since then is sort out the bits that stopped me from sitting in it. And... Uh, you know, I definitely felt I made another step and was able to sort of luxuriate for a little while in complete peace and serenity and none of that inner pressure that's driving you to be this or that or the other, uh, which is a huge relief uh, because it's such a strain, isn't it? Just always trying to be something, trying to achieve something or uh, have a certain status or whatever. It's such a relief just to stop that. And for a, for a while I was able to do that. And then you see the whole drive starting up again and see that it's not going anywhere and it dies away again. So uh, this, is, this is, you know, in telling you this, I'm not telling you that I'm particularly great. If you, it's, it's an easily graspable, but not that it's graspable, it's easily experienceable by anybody who seriously practices for any, any length of time. 
Well, the Buddha said uh, 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 it's attainable in seven days. No, not seven days, six days. No, not six days, etc. <laughs> hmm. What do you think are the main sort of blocks to actually to, to doing that? If you say, if you say in a way, it's, mm. in a certain sense, it's easy. Mm. Why? Why aren't we sort of leaning into those kind of experiences more? Mm. What, are, what what's stopping us? Mm. Well, uh, there's. Uh, um, we we come into this life with a pre-packaged structure to our experience, if you see what I mean. So that um, we come into this life with a predisposition to interpret the world as solid and fixed and real out there, and to interpret I as somehow in here, independent of the experience. So it's part of the the given. Uh, it's, it's in Buddhist terms, it's sahaja, born with us, or sahati, conate. It exists with us. So from the very first moment that a, that a baby opens its eyes, it's beginning to face the problem of what the hell's going on. And uh, in order to, uh, to grasp what's going on, it is, um, it's, it's going to use this pre-packaged uh, interpretive framework of I and world, which are independent of each other and which are, in some sense, independent of experience. So there's a, a moment of experience which seems to be an experience of something the other side of the experience and that seems to be experienced by something, someone, who's the other side of the experiencing. Is that sufficiently complicated to <laughs> lose you? Um, so that that that's the framework we use. Otherwise, it's very, very difficult to, to know what's going on, just in an ordinary, everyday sense. So this, uh, this survival mechanism, because from an evolutionary point of view, it's, it's what enables the organism to survive more effectively and to thrive. Um, and from a, from a Buddhist uh, rebirth perspective, it's something we've been doing since beginningless time. So it's a deeply ingrained habit and it, um, it, first of all, we're not even conscious that it's going on. We just completely take for granted the framework that our experience is, uh, is placed within, the interpretive framework that our, our experience is handled by I, world, self, other. And we take that for granted. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an instinct. Well, in, in Buddhist terms, it's below the level of, uh, of uh, our, our, um, our, 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 our everyday consciousness, you see what I mean? So consciousness comes with a, uh, with a pre-packaged pre framework, and then on top of that we add all our daily experiences, which are then fitted into that framework. But we can't see that framework. It's like the basement of a house. You don't see the basement because the, they're under the ground and the walls are built on top of them. So it, it's really quite a major effort to even be aware of that as there. And then far more to, uh, uh, to undo it, if that's the right term, to see through it so that it ceases to, to dominate. So it's, a, it's, it's not a simple thing and it's, it's instinctive, you might say. It's very deeply ingrained in, in every moment of awareness. So if you're going to undo that, you've somehow got to get from the position of it being inside that framework to undoing the framework. And uh, that's, that's not so easy in a way. Again, on this solitary retreat, I had a, a, a vivid and, um, a, 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 to begin with, rather terrifying experience of the... Uh, extraordinary tidal power of, um, of this habit of, of, of forming things into I, of identifying I and identifying other. And it's, it's, like it, it's a, a, an extraordinary force which is outside your control. And so I'd have a little bit of an experience of an open space, um, which is wonderful, delightful, and I just think, <laughs> I'm just going to stay here. And then, bang! In it comes. I remember uh, uh, on, on the solitary retreat, I got um, I got uh, some songs going through my mind as one does. The last long solitary retreat, it was hymns, 
and it was rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee, uh, which you can tell what that retreat was like. <laughs> um, uh, but in this one, there are the two sets of songs that went, one was Leonard Cohen, who I, I didn't even know Leonard Cohen had had a comeback. I knew him from the 1960s. And uh, it was a song which had a refrain, and none of us would meet with her in the house of mystery. It's, it's, it seems so long ago, Nancy, anybody knows that song. So the house of mystery. I felt I had to go into the house of mystery. We won't go into the songs. Very beautiful, very melancholy, but very, very beautiful. Then the other was um, a song by Joni Mitchell, in, in which is called Both Sides Now. And um, uh, I got the, the words mixed up. I remember them as I've looked at mind from both sides now. <laughs> it's actually I've looked at life from both sides now, but I was looking at mind. And uh, so I, I thought, oh, Joni Mitchell's been singing about this. <laughs> and then, then, and then I thought, that's, a, that's a really Buddhist song. <laughs> so I did a little bit of research, and I, I, I wanted to know, was um, Joni Mitchell, had she been a Buddhist? And, well, first of all, I, I discovered, which I didn't know, that she'd had an, a long affair with uh, Leonard Cohen, who was a Buddhist of a sort. Is Mangala here? He met him at, uh, at um, Samyiling in 1916, uh, six or seven. Anyway, uh, but then I discovered something she'd written about an encounter that she had. She'd been on the, the famous Rolling Thunder tour with um, uh, Bob Dylan. Come on, you all know it. <laughs> and uh, um, with uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg and other luminaries of the, of the, the scene. And uh, she said for the first time in her career in, in, uh, in music, she got onto cocaine. So she started taking cocaine quite regularly. And Ginsberg was obviously a bit concerned about her and uh, um, suggested to her that she saw his guru, who was Trungpa Rinpoche, uh, an important Tibetan guru, who uh, started his work in, in uh, America at the same time as Bhante started here. In fact, Bhante knew Trungpa quite well because he was here first. So she said that she, uh, Trungpa asked her, do you believe in God? So she said, I do believe in God and took out her bag of, of cocaine. So she said then Trungpa went into a very strange state and he started sort of what she, it, it, she described his nostrils as going in and out. Presumably he was breathing in her pain or whatever and then breathing it out as, as, uh, as meta, we could say. And she said she immediately was precip precipitated into an egoless state. Uh, it's extraordinary. She said it so plainly and simply. Uh, and then that lasted for about three days. It ended because she suddenly thought, I'm in an egoless state. <laughs> so I'm telling this long story partly because it's a jolly good yarn. But <laughs> <laughs> partly because it illustrates the way in which the habit just kicks back in even if you do, uh, you know, under the influence of a, a really rather extraordinary man, get sort of taken out of yourself, as we say, taken out of yourself. So I experienced that very strongly on the retreat, this, this return of the, of the habit, you know, you're sort of sitting there blissfully, just floating away in the blue sky, and you, then the thought comes, oh, God, I'm going to tell everybody about this. And, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm enlightened. And, uh, uh, yeah. um, or not even as, as, as gross as that. It's more like sort of, hmm, I wonder what I can make for lunch. Um, <laughs> and th important things like that. After a while, it just became laughable. I found it really amusing, this uh, horrible little fellow who just keeps on popping up and uh, reconstructing himself. And... Um, uh, uh, it, after a while, I was just able to sort of laugh, laugh at myself, as it were, and that would kind of dissolve it. But what I was able to see in that situation where I'd been on my own for, for five months, not completely on my own, but more or less on my own for five months, and in my six month on retreat, you know, I'd reached a fairly still state, and I'd done a lot of work dealing with, um, with karma, you could say. Uh, and... Uh, so I felt pretty clean and uh, then was able to get into that sort of state. But the habit, this, it's not karmic habit, it's uh, what they call a dvaya um, vasana, the, uh, the effect of the twofold grasping. It just kicks back in. 
and uh, you have to keep on keeping free of it. So this is a long way of saying it's difficult mm -hmm. <laughs> because there's a deeply ingrained habit which I think in some, in some ways you can also associate with, um, uh, with the animal dimension of us, if you see what I mean. It's, it's an instinct which then gets mixed up with the, the ability to, to, to self-identify. And it's, uh, it's, as inst it's as deep as that instinctive habit of uh, reforming the world. Fortunately, I've got to the stage where I'm not, af not so afraid of being without it. Uh, because that's the first thing, that it's frightening to be without it, because it's, you know, <laughs> who wants to be without I? Actually, it's a great relief. But um, to be free from that, uh, t t t it seems to one that the, the uh, transcending of the, of the I is sort of death. It's, it's it, uh, the, the big black hole seems like that to begin with. You, you feel really quite terrified, maybe. And uh, you could scramble onto the safe shore of... Uh, of uh, habitual patterns and so on. But, um, yeah, I, I managed to, to calm that a bit. Uh, but still, the habit is there. Still the, the, uh, the grasping for identity, the grasping for an interpretive framework is so habitual. Is there a... Um So it's so like it, it. It's clearly something that's very difficult, even with lots of practice. There's a, there's a sense of something positive happening, hmm. but a sense of this sort of elastic band kind of sort hmm. of pinging back and still, hmm. uh, still sort of dealing with the same hmm. uh, things. We when we look at the life, if you look at the life of the Buddha, what he seemed, he, what seemed he needed to do, and the, the sort of the degree to which he hmm. needed to change his life and hmm. leave his family behind hmm. and leave. Um, all the sort of worldly comforts that he had mm. behind and go live in a forest mm. and do nothing but meditate and yeah. uh, is that is that necessary to mm. um, <coughs> for enlightenment I think or, or, or mm. well I, I think you'd have to say that it, w it, it, it you couldn't say that it was absolutely necessary but I think that in practical terms it is if you see what I mean it, 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 it presumably uh, it, it's possible within the midst of life to undo all that but I think it, really when it comes down to it the problem is that the world is reinforcing this habitual tendency it constantly is calling for you to to be something it's a very strong experience of that coming out of this retreat I'd um, you know, as I began to engage with other people really good people who are you know pretty mature even pr spiritually mature I'd, I'd got rather too sharp a perception of them. Don't worry, it's, it's dimmed a bit now, so I'm not looking at you like this. But uh, I'd notice um, the sort of th this slightly constructed identity that people carry around with them. And I'd notice myself falling into that. I'd, I'd sort of say something over the dinner table. I think, why do you say that? You don't really want to be like that. You don't have to be like that. So yes, it 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 carries on, but um, what what you will find? Uh, it, it, oh yes, what what you you need therefore a period when you're insulated from those sort of pressures, the the the, the world constantly asking you to be a self, uh, and uh, you need to take undertake this under the right circumstances with a certain degree of well, faith for a start it can be quite shocking uh, and with uh, a certain amount of understanding you need a framework of conceptual understanding so you can orient yourself but I think it is quite necessary at some point to spend time at least in isolation if not in solitude we, we are generally advised to spend at least a month every year on solitary retreat I think probably Dave Metra is the only person who does this but uh, uh, I think it's very good advice because uh, in that, in that month a year, you'll get a chance to experience free from any external uh, impetus or uh, pull. And yes, it's, it's also necessary to detach yourself as much as you possibly can from, from worldly concerns and interests. I don't say all at once by any means, but to gradually lessen your stake in the game, uh, which doesn't mean that you don't work, work for the benefit of others, 
but that you're less and less invested. And, you know, you don't have to do it right now, but that, you're, that the progress of one's life probably needs to be one of uh, progressively disinvesting. Sorry, this is just what the Buddhist tradition says and <laughs> what my own experience suggests, that uh, really if you're, if you're to make the, the final, well, to go, to go much more deeply in this direction, solitude is necessary. All, all, all the advice you get from the, the old masters is of this kind. Some solitude is necessary. If not absolute solitude, then isolation from uh, the uh, uh, situations in which you're required to have an identity and to play out a role. And, uh, yes? So there could be a temptation to sort of feel like either I need to... Hmm let go of all mm. these things that tie me into the world right. as you talk about uh, and just completely uh, to live a, almost, a, almost a monastic life in order to mm. really go for the, sort of really yeah. aim for enlightenment yeah. or sort of forget about it altogether right. it seems like probably the answer is somewhere in, in between the two but how, how does one got the right answer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how yeah. does one kind of how does one sort of do that being sort of pulled in two directions at the same time, how does one sort of tread that, that tightrope? Well, uh, I suppose I can't really say because everybody will work that out for themselves and it, it, it's not possible for anybody else to work it out for you. Uh, um, so you have to feel your way, your way forward and you'll find that you're pulled in two different directions. And, uh, you know, I've seen people who are who then pulled into into the world, if you like to use that shorthand, it's not quite that simple. And then, you know, realize after some time down the line that, oh dear, they, they, they'd missed something from the beginning. I've also seen people who plunged very fully into a more isolated, um, solitary, or at least um, highly focused life, and then suddenly realize they've missed out a whole set of desires, child, having children, family, whatever. And, uh, uh, probably one, everybody's going to be slightly different in that respect. And it's, it's not that if you choose the, the more intensive, let's call it that, way, that you're necessarily going to uh, be able to make progress in that. You may just not be ready for it. Maybe just a lot that you've not resolved and that might actually be better if you just got on with a, uh, not, not a fully worldly life, but f carried on with a, a life in the world um, but keeping your, your spiritual aspiration and even your spiritual practice very much alive. So we, everybody has to find their, their calibration within that, and probably most of us are going to be somewhere in the, in the middle, in the amphibious between them. I, I always thought I'd just have to be a, a, a monk, because I, I, I saw so clearly what it really involved, uh, and uh, I knew that I couldn't. I knew that there was too much unresolved, and... Uh, I was fortunately able to, uh, you know, manage to stay clear of, of, of a career and, and a family and so forth. Uh, not that I'm trying to suggest those are bad, but for me, they, w they were not what I wanted. But I wasn't able to just fully immerse myself in that sort of way. So I think it's something that everybody has to work out for themselves. We have to try to create a, a Buddhist movement. We have created a Buddhist movement that has the full breadth. And if you live the the full monastic knife doesn't really mean that you're doing it more than somebody who doesn't. Uh, and if you're uh, not living that sort of life, it doesn't mean that you're, you're, uh, you're not doing it. So uh, we have to work that out for ourselves. But at some point, I think everybody is going to have to spend some time in a high degree of, a, a relative degree of, uh, of solitude and uh, uh, isolation, even if it's only for a month or whatever. I think for, for really getting much more deeply into the stuff of things, you need that sort of solitude. I, I, I found I'm, I'm an extrovert, so I'm compulsively driven towards the world, and <laughs> to be sort of shut off from that was extremely important for me. Uh, and it, it, you know, the, the, the tendency to look for engagement is, 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 um, is so powerful that the more isolated you can be, the better. <coughs> Do you? Uh, so I was. Um, I sort of experienced that being on being on solitary retreat, mm. and then coming back and feeling mm. like there it all there it all is again. <laughs> there um, it all is again. And yeah. um, do you think? Do you think it's sort of? 
do you think it's harder to practice sort of in the world now than it used to be? So, like, I guess from when you started practicing or even further back to the time of the Buddha, is it mm-hmm. just been getting progressively more difficult mm-hmm. outside of the conditions, say, of the solitary retreat mm-hmm. to practice mm-hmm. the Dharma? Yeah, it's always very difficult to make these sort of speculations, uh, but uh, I suspect on the whole it is. And uh, I think that uh, the circumstances of, of a modern Londoner's life are e- extremely busy and with multiple opportunities for distraction. Uh, you notice uh, the, the, the speed with which people fill the silence uh, on, the, on the tube train with a mobile phone. Uh, it's instant. It's a just definition of a split second. Uh, so we, we have at our disposal in the modern world multiple means of distraction. And distraction means distraction from that open space, that, that uh, well, the boredom that I talked about last night, the, the open space within which uh, you can d- discover the real truth. Uh, so I think that there's a huge amount of, uh, of uh, temptation to just pull away from experiencing ourselves in this raw, a deeper way, experiencing well, the way I've been thinking of it more recently is experiencing mind itself, what mind is, what awareness is, what consciousness is. We're just so much involved. We're we're, we're so compulsively drawn and people are are paying, or rather earning money from getting us to get into distraction. And, uh, you know, you, you get to the point where people can't even really experience anything except through a mobile phone. I remember going to a, uh, uh, an opera in, in Birmingham, it was a remarkable opera in, 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 on, the, on the canals and there were a crowd of, uh, of school children there and they were all watching the opera on their mobile phones and it was actually just the other side of the mobile phone <laughs> but it's, the, it's become the reality and it's a second order reality so uh, a, a lot of the time we live in conceptualised construction of reality uh, which is already one removed from reality itself. And then we add on to that a secondary and often a tertiary construction of reality so that it's much harder to turn back down. Of course, it's not all bad because there are forces within modern culture that, that go in the opposite direction. So one, one mustn't be too doomy and gloomy. And also the, the modern situation provides m- many opportunities for encountering the Dhamma. But uh, I, I do suspect that uh, the the, the extraordinary growth of technology uh, masks reality from us. You know, have you ever had the experience of, uh, um, well, I was going to say, have you ever had the experience of the internet going down? I don't know whether you get this in, in, in London anymore, but uh, I live in Wales where we have a, 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 um, a satellite dish, and it, it doesn't work that well when there are clouds. So I live in Wales, dot, dot, dot. Um, uh, But um, uh, I'm used to it now, so the internet's not down. But what I find with with, with people often is if the internet goes down, they enter a sort of panic. Um, And I'm not joking. It is something akin to a panic. Or or where you're, you you know, suddenly something goes wrong. Um, Like, you know, sitting on a plane a, a while ago and the... You know, we got on the plane, they started the engines, and then they stopped the, the engines, and we all had to get off. And everybody's complaining as if, you know, everything should work perfectly all the time, because that's the illusion that the modern situation gives. Uh, it, it gives the illusion that everything works smoothly. It's, it, reality is not dukkha. It just needs a slight adjustment, um, a, a, a larger bandwidth, probably. Uh, I'm sort of not joking. It's, it's like that. So if one can, say, make any sort of comparison, how on earth can you make a comparison, uh, it would be along those lines. Of course, I also work in India, and I'm working in, in Hungary too, uh, in which the, 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 the Roma that I'm working with, still live in the third world, in the middle of a first world country. And nowadays, actually, they've all got mobile phones and uh, constantly on the mobile phones, but the same in India. But until quite recently, people uh, still lived a much more sensible life. In other words, a life which was based much more on immediate sensing 
which were much more based on immediate contact between individuals and much less removed, isolated, um, and taken onto a, onto a, a constructed level. So, unfortunately, at the same time, there's a lot of superstition and uh, ignorance. So it's very difficult to say. In that respect, perhaps it was better. In this respect, perhaps it was worse. But those are the particular issues I think that we very much face right now is the deluge of information, absolute deluge of information, and uh, the uh, extraordinarily uh, available opportunity for distraction, something that will occupy your mind and keep you from experiencing that underlying dukkha and therefore allowing for that space to open up in which you can ex uh, relax, finally, ultimately relax. What can we sort of do? <coughs> what can we do about that? In in that, this sort of, it's pretty difficult to sort of pull ourselves completely out of that, that uh, information overload. In the sense that we're sort of we're sort of tied up with it. Our work is often tied up into it in various mm. ways. Our mm. social connections and so on. Mm. Is there a, mm. Do you do you think there's a way to extricate oneself, or should or should one? Well, I think the first thing is one needs to create boundaries where technology are concerned. I've taken a, a vow of uh, of uh, uh, a technology uh, brahmacharya, um, a, a, a chastity, uh, in the sense that uh, um, I, I do not buy a new phone just because there's a bigger and better one, while my present one actually does the job perfectly well. Do you see what I mean? So that, that I think it's important for one to, to make, make decisions not to buy into what is, after all, an artificially driven, uh, um, market-driven uh, process. Uh, which is, is done to take your money out of your pocket, not to make you happier and better, honestly. It really is like that. Um, so I think it's important to, to make sure you use technology and that it doesn't use you, uh, which takes quite a bit of, of, of self-restraint, uh, quite a bit of discipline. You know, how many times do you need to listen to, to, uh, to look at your email? You know, I remember the days when uh, you waited for the post. <laughs> I, do, I do know what I mean by post. It's, uh, <laughs> um, um, you know, where, where a letter from India would take ten days to get get there. Um, of course, once it would take three months. But um, you, you need to actually place boundaries on on your on your involvement if your work requires it. Make that a bound. Make a boundary around that. You'll do this, but you're not going to do that. And if you can do the thing perfectly adequately with what you've got right now, don't go questing something better. I, I sometimes think we should have classes at the LBC on uh, computer brahmacharya, um, <laughs> technology brahmacharya. You know, we really need the latest. And and we are buying into a uh, a, a, a conscious. Uh, manipulation of our uh, desires. It, they study it. Why does a new uh, mobile phone come out at the interval it comes out at? I, I don't know this for certain, but I've read studies in this sort of area. It seems to me what they've worked out is that when you get the new one, you get a hit, don't you? You're just so happy. You've got this wonderful thing which can do, you know, things... <laughs> You, you only use about 0.5% of its capacity. It could probably take you to the moon. But um, uh, you are so pleased and proud and you want to show everybody and, and so on. And you get a real feeling of happiness and delight. You, your ego expands a bit because it's achieved an apple something or other. You can see how out of date I am. Um, you, 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 it, it, it's really true. Watch yourself when you get a new thing. Put the, put the package on the table, sit and contemplate it for a while, <laughs> examining the feelings that arise within you. Mm -hmm. And uh, open it up and, 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 and sit doing uh, the, the, the apple bhavana, the <laughs> <laughs> contemplation of, 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 of your mobile phone. And look at the, the feelings of joy and delight that arise within you. I'm, you they will. They will. I, I've... I've, I've in my own way, done this. 
And then, after a little while, you know, it goes on. The next day, you, you wake up, oh, my new phone, and where is it? And it goes on like that for a few days. But after a few months, the, the satisfaction that you get from the newness of it begins to fade. Uh, this, is, this, is, uh, you know, this is all uh, uh, um, empirically studied. Um, and after a certain time, that it fades to the degree that you're no longer that turned on by your phone. Um, uh, and uh, at that point, they bring out a new one. They know what they're doing then. Uh, uh, that they know that you, your, your delight in the old phone is, is worn out because if they produce it too early, you think, ah, no, I don't need no one, I've got this one. Um, they also make sure that your, your sense of, um, of, uh, of envy is stimulated by showing beautiful people showing the, uh, holding the phone and then you feel envy. So, yes, we need to check out of the, of the, of the uh, technology rat race by yeah, using it insofar as you need to use it. And, um, and I know quite a lot of people have jobs connected to IT or in IT, fair enough, but don't let it dominate you and make sure that at the end of the day you switch off. And I know many firms now give you a mobile phone and expect you to be at the end of the phone any time. Refuse, get another job. Um, <laughs> please, let me have another job. Um, but these are in your control. You don't have to do these things. So and I, th I think that if you're serious about Buddhist practice to any extent, even if you want uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the good goods of this life and you want a family and so forth, fair enough. It's quite normal. But just don't buy into the... the uh, the pressures that are being placed upon you by into pressures. Anyway, you get the metaphor. Yes, I think it's very serious. Uh, and um, make sure that you do not just simply, whenever you feel a bit uneasy, um, reach for some distraction. Turn the TV on or whatever. Something, there's always something you can do. Leave spaces. Um, you know, strong advice is often given that when you finish one activity, stop and just allow a space to open up and allow your, your sort of the totality of your being to catch up and enter that space and then move on to the next thing. So I think it's a lot of, a lot of uh, easy things that one can do to, to change, uh, to check out of the, the, the pressures that modern life gives us at the same time as using them beneficially. You know, I can stay in contact with my brothers and sisters in India and um, I can make easy arrangements to go and so on. But uh, I, 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 I try to keep myself quite circumscribed and only look at, at uh, email or WhatsApp or whatever once a day. I don't always succeed. It's like the news. How often do you need to know the news? How often? Um, it's interesting because for six months I didn't know any news. Um, when I switched on, it was just more of the same. Um, you know, in some areas the volume had been turned up, um, rather uh, fascinatingly. Um, and, and, you know, instead of Mrs. May, it was uh, Mr. What's-his-name? Um, Johnson, thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Trump was up to his usuals. And uh, uh, Mr. Modi was back and so on. Uh, but it was it's sort of more of the same maybe slightly different configurations and I realised I didn't, didn't miss it at all and usually I look at the news, I tell myself I'm looking at it because I need to know what's going on in the world because I'm involved in the Buddhist movement actually I don't <laughs> once a week would probably be quite enough but it, it, we have these means of distraction and the uh, um, never ending soap opera of news uh, which um, distracts us from the real business so from the ridiculous back to the sublime Phew, thank goodness for that um, <laughs> we've got just we've just got probably got time for one more question I reckon okay so thinking back to so you seem to have, you seem to have answered the question of whether enlightenment's possible with a yes um, do you think would you say that for the people us in this room yourself included would you say, how likely would you say it is to happen <laughs> in this before we die? And uh, does, does it, to what extent does that matter? 
Uh, well, I, I think it's completely reasonable that everybody within this life could enter the stream of the Dhamma. That means that you have uh, a sufficiently deep taste of the Dhamma, a taste of that experience of, uh, of being completely at ease in, in emptiness, if you like, put it that way, and to feel uh, you know, joyous forces arising within you. It's perfectly possible for everybody here to have got to the point where that is irreversible. In other words, that you will not lose it. It will be there, uh, available to you relatively uh, readily. I, I think that's perfectly possible. But if you're talking about enlightenment, we need to be clearer what, what you mean. Uh, for instance, is it possible for you in this lifetime to become a Buddha? Well, the broad Buddhist tradition would say no, because you have to be reborn and then, uh, you have to die rather, and then re reborn in a place where there's no Dhamma. That's what a Buddha is. But for you to wake, an, wake up to a decisive degree is completely possible. Uh, you simply have to be single-minded enough mm -hmm. about it. And uh, probably for most people that means, f to begin with, building the foundation, creating a foundation of ethics, uh, building a, 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 a happy, healthy mind, uh, creating good relations with others, just creating the circumstances. And then on that basis, deepening your meditation so that you're got at least temporarily a little bit of freedom in, in the meditative state, and then on that basis uh, 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 reflecting on the real nature of things and getting some definite taste of that. I, I think this is completely possible, uh, and, and, and almost say inevitable, if you just apply yourself to it. And it doesn't mean giving up everything immediately, it just means getting yourself in a bit more deeply, a bit more deeply, a bit more deeply. And uh, as you get more deeply into it, you'll get more and more reward from it. it your, your life will be just satisfying and wholesome from an ordinary point of view, and that will lead you a bit further. So, uh, yes, I think to think in terms of Buddhahood is, you know, many lifetimes work, because you've got to build up all the qualities that enable you to be a Buddha, that is to be born at a time when there's no Dharma and be able to communicate it afresh from a sort of perfect uh, being that's a big thing to do and you should take steps in that direction because my goodness the universe needs Buddhists uh, but within this lifetime it's completely possible for you to get to the point where you, you uh, can rest in the Dhamma and uh, you know it, it's, we, it, it's not a good thing I think to say this person has done it and that person hasn't because then you get grabby you start thinking of it as something you have but uh, everybody will experience an increasing sense uh, after some time, well, it's all just unfolding. It's happening of its own accord. You don't need to make an effort. You need to make a little bit of an effort to keep yourself, you know, your feet to the fire. No, that's not the right image. <laughs> to keep yourself um, the pot boiling. No, that's not a good image. Anyway, well, you get the point. To keep yourself at it. But uh, the, the sense one will increasingly get is that something is flowing a little bit independently of one's will, of one's identity, and that you can rest in and you can, uh, you can rely on. Maybe it's going to take a long time for you to completely soak yourself in that, but you can be sure that that will happen. And I, I would expect, I hereby predict everybody to achieve that point in this lifetime if, if you just keep at it. Uh, really, just keep at it. And, you know, sometimes people say, ah, oh, there's a the technique that you're missing. Rubbish. Um, it's, it's not a matter of techniques. It, it, it pretty much any meditation technique will do. The main thing is keeping at it. And uh, keeping it up at it with a, a sufficiently honest and um, sincere mind. And, and you will get there. I'm quite sure of that. I could say I know that from my own experience without making any claims about my experience. And in the sense that I know in what I've seen that it's, it is perfectly possible. I don't think I'm particularly exceptional in so far as I've got somewhere in, along that line. I, I think anybody can do it. Thank you very much, Sweetie. Mm. I think the, um, you talked earlier about the, the need for both, uh, both faith and understanding. And I think that in, in, talking about, in talking about enlightenment, I think you really offered something of both of those. Both of those things. Thank you. Very Good. Much. So, um, 
do uh, do stay for the Tuesday evening meditation class if you'd like. Uh, the evening is still young, and um, and also definitely do come back for the last uh, of these three tomorrow. So we've looked at we've explored suffering, we've explored enlightenment, and we've uh, tomorrow. So the Gupta will be interviewing Spooky and exploring what that means uh, for more than just ourselves, uh, for the world, for the world at large, and what that might have to offer for that. But um, first of all, let's just put hands together and thanks, Spooky, very much.